Luke chapter 2. Listen, listen. This is part of the old Christmas story, but we're going to take a different perspective. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration of Quirinius when, gov when he was governor of Assyria. And all were to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came to give birth. I want to share with us from the topic this morning, Christmas travel. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, this morning, the pastor's going to talk about Christmas travel. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, are you traveling this Christmas as you take your seat this morning? Aha! Uh -huh. Are you traveling this morning? Christmas travel. Many people have their own Christmas travel. Are y'all traveling? Anybody traveling this Christmas? Uh, I know the Robinsons are traveling. They're going to travel and keep traveling after the holiday. I see your hands. I see your hands. Anybody going by car? Anybody traveling by car? Anybody flying? Anybody flying? Anybody flying? Or taking the bus? Or walking? Now, I really mean that because you may travel just across the street to your neighbor and just say, I'm going to go spend time with some friends in the neighborhood. Or maybe you're traveling across town. Or maybe you're traveling across the world. Or, or, or maybe you're just traveling across the city to hang out with family and friends. But to some degree, we all try to do some travel. Here's one, here's one. We don't think about it, but some of us just travel from the bedroom to the living room. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, I'm just saying. Some of us, I ain't traveling far, but I'm going to go in here and watch the game while I eat. And we just travel to the next bedroom. Wherever you decide to spend your time, the whole idea, the whole intent of Christmas is not about the gifts. It's not about the lights, the trees. It's not about the packages. It's not about the shopping. It's not about all the stuff that you and I have been taught by the world to do. Our time of Christmas is a reflection of when God broke into time and space and crossed out of eternity into time to save you and me. He said, there's some messed up people in a messed up planet going through messed up things, and somebody needs a redeemer. Somebody needs a rescuer, and I'm going to break through time to go in and save them. That's Christmas. He came as a baby in a manger, but he died later on at 33 to save you and me. So whatever you're doing, our celebration at Christmas is to celebrate God's redemptive plan for you and me. It should remind us and encourage us that there is somebody greater than us who looked down the corridors of time and prepared for us. Think about it like this. A baby comes home. Moms and dads, we break all that we've been doing, and we change to focus everything on that baby to make sure that baby has all the food, the clothes, the warmth, that he or she goes without anything. We're there to take care of that baby. But in this case, this baby came to take care of us. Somebody ought to be glad and say, thank you, God, that you sent your son Jesus in the form of a baby. It, it, it might take us to look at it twice, at the hardships that the travel then had to be to get the baby here. Let me give you some background, some context. How did we get to Luke chapter 2, and what does it mean to us today? Luke chapter 2, and this in the Bible illuminates how God divinely moves people and circumstances for his own good and for his glory. Let me say this. You might think that you just got up on your own because your alarm clock went off this morning. You might think that you dressed yourself because you got use of your arms and your limbs. You might think that you got enough sense to drive here on your own. You can't move and muscle without God orchestrating that move. You don't know how much work it takes just to lift your hand for, for, the, for, the, for the electrolytes to move, to shift so that muscles can flex so that you can do this or do this 
or drive a car. We have to have God making moves in our life. And listen, God orchestrates every person's life like a conductor of an orchestra. And he directed Jesus' life and the people who would carry him from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And they thought they were just going for one reason. God said, no, I have you doing what seems to be a natural move for a supernatural purpose. God recognizes and moves in the life of a young couple named Joseph and Mary who are carrying the Christ child uh, from their little small abode in Nazareth. In this chapter, God invites us to move in a little bit closer to look at some of the things that had to unfold to make the birth even possible. You and I take it for granted. You think that when you have a baby, you have it hard. You think it's tough because you had to find some kind of way to get to the hospital to deliver. But how have you like to get to a barn to deliver? In this chapter, it helps us to appreciate the complex moves that we had to undertake, that this couple had to undertake, rather, to make this great prophecy come to life. And they didn't even understand at the moment that God was directing every part of their life. Listen, even when you and I go through heartache and hardship, God says, I'm using even your hurts to help move you from where you are to where I need you to be. Starting in Luke chapter number nine, God devotes 10 whole chapters as a narrative to a complete travelogue of Jesus from the crib to the cross and all the way through. And so that's why we have Luke, because he's taking us on a travel trip to tell us what happens. We're going to focus on just the first part of Luke's travel trip. Luke is writing the book named after himself because he had been commissioned uh, by someone to give a listing, a chronological, logical listing of this God person, this Christ person, because we don't understand how God works. And so he had been commissioned by a guy, by a guy named Theophilus uh, to write a rendering. And so we start here with Christmas travel. So we walk together and look at this pilgrimage. As we look at Christmas travel, look at the first part. The first part is talking about the timing, the timing for Christmas travel, the timing. Now listen, timing is everything. Listen, you and I don't catch a plane without timing. You already, if you're going to travel anywhere for Christmas, you already, you should have by now already done bought your airline ticket. You already done gone online, you looked at one of the travel sites, and you done found the time that the flight leaves, the airline that you're going to be riding on, where it's going to let you transfer, how long your transfer is going to sit you there, and then what time you should arrive. I say should because flights don't always get there when they say. But you've already looked into it, and you already decided. Or if, you, if you're driving, you've already looked into how far the trip is to get from here to Dallas. You've already decided where you're going to stop at Bucky's so you can go in and get snacks. Anybody stop at Bucky's? Just wave your hand. Y'all started smiling before I even said anything. Y'all know y'all going Bucky's. And you know you're going to Bucky's, and most of us don't even need anything that Bucky's has. You could have got it before you left home. You had Big Red in your car already. You had that Coca-Cola already. You had chips in your car. But you had to stop, walk through the crowd, go to the clean restrooms, and on your way back to the car, you, drank, you went off to about 14 different aisles. Well, I get some of this and some of that. That wasn't even in your travel plans. But we throw that in there. You got you to gotta have a Bucky stop. You just got to. That's just part of the rules of the road now. But there's a timing for everything. There's a timing for everything. Here's the timing. In chapter 1, it says, in those days. Everybody repeat after me. In those days. In those days. In what days? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in order to appreciate the story, you need to know some backstory. In chapter 1, we're not dealing with chapter 1 today, but in chapter 1, something happened in those days. In chapter 1, 
God started moving in miraculous ways. Angels started showing up on the scenes. Unnormal stuff started happening in those days. In those days, leading up to the Christmas narrative, God started moving from heaven to earth. Some miraculous people and situations. In those days, in those days, God allowed an angel to show up on the planet to talk to a young girl named Mary. We think Mary may have been about 13 or 14. And don't be surprised because back in those days, uh, young girls and young boys got married compared to our times today. So Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. We can't explain it. Theologians have, have, have theorized, but all we know is God allowed the Holy Spirit to move upon Mary in a special way where he implanted, he sent a seed to be inside of her that she would carry the Christ child. So he had to send an angel to let her know because this didn't happen normally. You don't just normally get up in the morning and an angel suspended in the air start talking to you. But when God is making major moves, he sent angels, messengers, to give the message, but also to give peace. Anybody need peace in their life? Sometimes, maybe, maybe this message is peace to you, telling you everything going to be all right. And whatever is coming up on you right now, although it may seem hard or it may seem miraculous, God is moving in your life, even as he's moving in their lives back then. So he shows up to say, Mary, don't be afraid. I know you ain't used to seeing angels floating in the air talking to people. One. Two, you're going to carry a child. It's from heaven to earth. you carrying the Son of God or God the Son in your womb. But it takes an angel to tell you something like that so you don't lose your mind. You think, wait, nobody else is going through this. I checked. Beth down the street, she ain't got that going on. Laquita down the other side of the street, she ain't got that going on. What's going on with me? Another miracle, another miracle. The, another angel in the book of Matthew had to show up to talk to her betrothed, her, 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 the, the guy who was going to be her husband. And understand, in those days, even though they were already not, quote, married, but they were betrothed or they were engaged. And the engagement was like being married. That's how serious it was. We take marriage too flippantly today. Even after you are married, we still don't want to act like we're married. We try to act like the world. Stop it. Stop it. So he, another angel had to go talk to her husband. Say, Joe, yo, Joe, let me holler at you for a minute. Joe turns around. There's another angel floating in the air talking to him. Uh, and first thing he says to Joseph is, do not be afraid. But, but I need to give you some information, Joe. Your girlfriend, your adopt, your, 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 your woman, the, the one you are betrothed to be with. She's already with child. Joe, don't get mad. Don't leave her because God is moving on her life. And it takes an angel to tell her to do that. I'm just saying, as a guy, I would need, uh, I would need God to tell me, go on and marry her because she's with a child that the Lord had prepared for her. Amen? Because you know us. We guys, we, 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 our attitude, our pride, you don't want your boys going like, dude, hey, Joe, 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 man, who, who? The Lord said, man, please, tell somebody else that. What really happened, Joe? What really went down? No, nah, man, I'm telling you. And so it takes God to move miraculously. Think about it like this. From the book of Genesis all the way to the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, God had been moving through prophets and through judges and through different kings and different people to try to tell the people that God said. But we killed the prophets. We disobeyed the kings. We didn't want to listen to anybody. So then God gives us 400 years of silence. Then all of a sudden he shows up in the New Testament. Behold. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And this shall be a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in swallowed clothes. God had to send miracles to talk to our crazy selves. He said, y'all ain't getting it. 
So then he let us not hear from him for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, he breaks into the scene, but he breaks onto the scene with miracles. Also, I believe he breaks into the scene with miracles because his son is showing up. You know, it's one thing when somebody else's kids make achievements and do good stuff. But when your son or your daughter do something great, you want everybody to know. Am I right about it? Don't y'all post stuff on Facebook when your child or your grandchild do something great? Don't you tell me, I just want to let y'all know my, grand, my grandson sang at the Christmas pageant at school. Yeah, 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 yeah. They sang, oh, come all you from, yeah, they did it. They did a good job. And, and you know, sometimes you have to coach them, and they start singing. Go ahead, sing, baby, go ahead. And you nudge them, and they get up there. For God, for God. So love the world. And then they start crying and they go, and you say, that's all right, baby. That's all right. <laughs> but then as a grandmother, especially grandparents, grandparents are especially crazy. Because it don't matter what your grandchild said or didn't say, you make everybody think that they just won the Academy Award. I want to thank you on behalf of all the people who made this possible. Shout out to my mom, my dad, everybody. And you tell everybody, like they just got a trophy or something. God is telling everybody, my son is showing up. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. My baby boy, my only child, he's showing up for your crazy self to save you, rescue you, help you, redeem you. Because you ain't going to get in any other kind of way. It took my son to show up on the planet to rescue you. Thank you very much. I'll let you later. Drop the mic and walk away. What? Just in case. Just in case you didn't get the message. This Christmas, I want you to know, my son showed up. But not only did he talk to Mary and Joseph, he had to talk to some old folk. He talked to Mary and Joseph to let them know that they were pregnant. But while he's dealing with them, over here on the other side of the, country, uh, of the town, he's dealing with two other people named Zachariah and Elizabeth. Two older people who have not, have not ever been able to have children. And they done moved on with their lives. They're up in age now. They're elderly. And he says, he sends another angel. Elizabeth. You're going to be with child. Elizabeth must have been sitting there going like, oh, you know what, dude, please. I'm up in my age now. I done started getting Medicare. <laughs> and now, and now, I'm going to have a child? What's going to happen to my benefits? Do I get to keep it? I mean, you know, I just need to know. And then the angel had to show up to her husband to let him know, your wife. Elizabeth, who's getting Medicare, is having a child. And, and, and you going to be the dad, and you're going to help take care of him. And his name is going to be John. Miracles were going on. God is showing up on the planet to let you know, no matter how old you are, how young you are, God was dealing with two extremes, a boy and a girl, 13, 14, 15, and an old couple in their 80s, both are in a, seeing God move in their life in miraculous ways. He's letting us know, I'm on the scene. And I'm moving in your situation and your life to make things happen. That's what's going on in those days. In those days. So that's the setup. The first part you need to understand of Christmas travel is that angels traveled to them to let them know that there's going to be some special stuff happening. The second thing is not just the timing for Christmas travel, but look at the motivation for Christmas travel. Oh, why are you traveling? Why are you traveling? Well, I'm traveling because I'm the one bringing the ham. And everybody's waiting for me to show up at the house with the Christmas ham. Why are you traveling? I'm traveling because I got gifts I want to take to my son and daughter who live in another state. Or, or, or my, my family members or some friends that I grew up with or some people I was in the military with or some people that I worked with across town and we're having a good Christmas celebration. So I'm traveling because I'm bringing gifts. Why are you traveling? What's the motivation? He says right here in the text though that the motivation is this in verse 2 and 3. 
For this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. That don't make mean nothing to us because we don't know who Quirinius, Quir, Quirinius was, and we don't care about a governor back in those days. Who is he? Why does he matter to us? And secondly, why did they go to be registered? They give you his name because it sets dates and times and space for you and I to understand what was moving and what's going on. God is letting you know, first of all, I move on the hearts and minds, just like I move miraculously in Elizabeth and Zechariah and in Mary and Joseph. I'm also moving in the life of governors and kings and presidents and people who don't know. Let me say this to you. Don't get it twisted. Don't get scared. Don't be uh, frustrated. Don't be angered or excited that people named Biden or named Trump or named uh, uh, Putin or named uh, 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 <laughs> be nice. But some of these other leaders in the world, don't worry about them. Don't be scared because God is telling us Quirinius was governor. He's letting us know, I'm getting ready to use the governor of that area. The king at the time was Caesar. Caesar scared everybody because Rome ruled everywhere. Rome had to rule over all of the known world at the time. And God still got Christ here. Whoever was president, is president, or will be president, don't disturb God. You don't have to like him, or you might like him. You might vote for him, or you don't vote for him. You might be happy or angry. You might be for their policies or against their policies. God is letting us know early on the motivation for travel is that I'm going to even use kings to get my goal done. Whether they wanted Jesus to come or not, oh, well. They, he's coming anyhow. One of the motivations for Christmas travel is to move in a certain way that I can show you that I'm going to use people who think that they're going to either help or obstruct my plans, but I'm going to get it through anyway. And so I'm going to use a worldly king and a worldly governor to do something. For the first time, they're going to take a census. Y'all know in the United States, we, can't, we take a census every 10 years. And the idea is to get a feel for how many people are in the United States and how many people of different racial backgrounds are in the United States and how many females and males are the in the United States because it helps the government plan for future events and activities, where to send the money. If more people are in this area of the country, we need to put more funds over here. If there are less, we, we put less. But the idea is this governor and this king are taking a census because they need to know how many people can we depend on to pay taxes because taxes are needed to sustain the Roman government, to sustain the, gov the, the uh, Roman army, and to pave roads. Do y'all know Linda and I have the opportunity, the privilege, to go to Rome uh, a few years ago, back uh, in 2019, before COVID. And we walked on some of the same roads that the Apostle Paul walked on, some of the same streets that Jesus may have walked on. Some of the same old cobble roads were still in existence today that Rome built back then. So when they raised funds for the Roman roads to be paid and worked on, we got to see the benefit of that even still now in the 21st century. That's amazing. We can't build roads today without getting potholes tomorrow. <laughs> Have you been there, Eric? When on Thursday you drive through, on Friday you go off into a hole? And it makes me angry when my tire finds a pothole. And it go bam! And then you shake and you sit there and go like, man, I just know it just bent my rim. And you're sitting there all upset. We just paid for those roads to be paid. We can't get no good roads. So that's what's going on. He's saying Rome is moving, and, I, and they're raising funds. Well, you say, what has that got to do with Christmas? I'm glad you asked. This means that much of us today, 
missed the move of God. While God was moving on the people, he says, in order to get the taxes, the way the governor set it up is this. If you were born in Bethlehem, if your mama and your daddy and your grandma and grandpa and them were born in Bethlehem, then your family lineage needs to all come back to Bethlehem to pay taxes there. Because that's where we're going to write your name and say, Russell was part of the family of this in that town. So although Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth, they had to travel to Bethlehem for tax purposes. That's what the world says. God needed Mary and Joseph to be in Bethlehem because he had prophesied in Isaiah. He prophesied in the book of Micah. He prophesied in other Old Testament passages that the Son of God would be born in Bethlehem. So, huh, how can we get little Joe and little Mary out of Nazareth and to get them safely to Bethlehem for the birth of the Christ child? The other move that God is making when he sends them is the travel there. How do, get them, how do I get them there? There's a census, a population count. But listen, let me tell you this. There's an urgency to get them to Bethlehem because Mary is now nine months pregnant. How would you like it? Women, if your husband tells you, baby, let's take a trip. Now, there's even a risk of flying today in the United States if you're pregnant. Many airlines and many physicians won't let you even travel because the change in pressure, cabin pressure, can stimulate the baby to start moving and you might give birth while you're in the air. So women don't even travel at nine months. But here's Joe. Uh, baby, we're going to Bethlehem. And it's going to be a, a four-day journey. But don't worry, I secured a donkey. And so you ride the donkey and I'll walk beside you. But we need to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem now. Uh, we need to go pay taxes because God said so. It better be a God move. I can see Mary looking at Joe kind of funny. You want me to ride a donkey for four days? No buckies, no clean restrooms, no fresh food. I got a pack of lunch bags. And you know how you eat. I got to pack extra food. And then we got to have food for the animal to eat. We got to make sure there's places where we can stop to get water and for the animal to have water. And you know, she sit there when that donkey start eating, he's going to sit there and gnaw on that grass till he's done. And then we go on a little further down the road. For four days, we're going to take a trip. So when you talk about Christmas travel, you ain't said nothing yet when you get in your nice, comfortable car and drive down the road to Houston for two and a half, three hours, depending on how you drive, and you get there. But we're talking about four days, not four hours, four days. And Mary and Joseph are getting ready to take this trip. They used their exercise, their work, to know the Lord, to trust him to get them there. But their motivation was to deliver the Christ child from where they were to where they need to be. But every time you and I take a trip, number three, there's always or usually unexpected events on Christmas travel. That's our third point, uh, unexpected events that happen. You know what happens on those unexpected trips. Ah, I forgot to pack such and such. I forgot to bring my sinus medicine. I forgot to bring the kids such and such. Or you get on the plane, oh, I just remembered. I didn't set the alarm before we left the house. I, I left uh, part of the stuff I was going to pack in the bag on the sofa or on the bed, and I didn't put it in the suitcase. Uh, I didn't get the Tylenol. When we land, I got to go right to get the Tylenol, because I got a headache already right now. There's always unexpected stuff that happens. Oh, there's a, I, I hear a funny sound on the engine. Sounds like we got a flat tire. Always some unexpected stuff that happens along the way. Oh, I, I didn't get the tickets. Which ticket? No, no, I got the airline tickets. I got them on my phone, but the phone's at home. 
unexpected stuff happens, and you're about to lose your mind. Where do you get that from? Look at verse number 6. It says, and while they were there, the time came to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. That was unexpected. Mary and Joe had never traveled like that before, and on this very unusual trip, this young girl gives birth, and it doesn't say anything about her mama being pregnant or being present while she's pregnant. It doesn't say anything about her relatives being there. And her unborn, her unborn son is now being born, the firstborn son of God. And they were poor, and they wrapped him in strips of cloth. Swaddling clothes is what they call it. And they laid him in a manger. A manger is a trough, an area where animals uh, eat from. Whether you pack it for the family, or you pack it for Christmas road trip, or if you're packing to travel around the world, you still got to pack but there's going to be some unexpected stuff that happens. Nine months, and she's traveling. And now she's ready to deliver this baby, but there's no room for them at the end. The Savior of the world is being born, and there's no room. Understand this about the end. The end is not like Holiday Inn. It's not like, uh, it's not like uh, going to Fiesta, Texas, and there's hotels all in the area. There were not hotels at all at that time. The inn that they were talking about is places and people's homes. Uh, in those days, it was considered to be very inhospitable to not take people in who were traveling. It was considered rude if you didn't let people stay at your house. So on top of the roof, there were places where you would let family and friends come and stay when they come to visit you. That was considered the end. If you remember after Jesus died and his disciples showed up and they were in a place called the upper room. It was a place that they used at the moment to gather, to worship, to wait for the Holy Spirit to show up. Anytime in the Old Testament uh, people traveled and a, 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 one of the travelers for, for God would travel, one of the prophets, they would have a side room. And the side room was really made up of two parts. The lower half is where the animals stayed, and you step up about two or three steps, and that part is where the people stayed. But they were right there with the animal. That's the manger. The manger was in some place outside under uh, the stars. It was in a house with the lower part of the house for the animals, and they, they would bring the animals and bring them in out of the weather. And then the upper part was where mom and dad and the kids would sleep. So you could see and smell and hear the animals right there. So while you're sleeping, you would hear, or you hear the cow, right there. So understand the kind of end we're talking about. There was no room for anybody. Here's the other thing. Notice this. The scripture doesn't say it, but it's not likely that Mary and Joseph traveled by themselves. In those days, if everybody was traveling, to their hometown, taxes for the census, they traveled in groups. So the whole strip, the whole road from Nazareth to Bethlehem was filled with people traveling in the same direction. Secondly, they did it because it was safety. Uh, there were marauders, robbers on the roads, and the best way to travel is you travel in packs. You travel in groups. Here's the other benefit. When they got to Bethlehem, Joseph's family lived there. Remember, he had to go back to the town where his family is from. So it's likely that he still had relatives in Bethlehem. And the story doesn't tell it, but we know that later on, when the wise men show up to see Jesus, he's not in the manger anymore. He's in a house. So it's likely that Mary and Joseph had taken lodging with some family, and they finally got to stay inside a house with some family. So now the whole Christmas story changes for you, doesn't it? But the idea is God moved on kings. God moved on governors. God moved on crowds to protect Mary and Joseph and the baby child. God moved on relatives. God moved on people in every part of their life to make sure that his will You're still standing out looking at me kind of strange. Let me say it like this. 
if you stop to get gas this morning, God moved on QT gas station to be open for you so you can go in and get the gas. God moved on QT so that you can get that cup of coffee to wake you up to get to church. God moved because you know you were short of gas before you got here and you had to stop at Valero to get gas. At every move today, God moved in your life in a natural way, which was actually supernatural for you to make sure that you got here. But you thought it was just going to happen because you got up this morning. God moved that your alarm clock went off. God moved that you had clothes to put on to get here. God moved. Every move of your life this morning was already orchestrated by God for your purpose, for his glory. No one noticed the simple things that God does to get us to a place. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you get frustrated at a stoplight because you say, oh, I'm going to be late, and you're mad because the stoplight caught you? Maybe God orchestrated that stoplight to prevent an accident down the road because you were driving too fast anyway. God orchestrates our lives in simple ways, but we miss it. We miss it because we think that God is against us when bad stuff happens. And a lot of times God is just trying to tell us, I'm slowing you down because you're trying to do stuff out of my will and out of my timing. Mary and Joseph were able to travel to Bethlehem for the census, for the sake of the child to be born in this world. Christmas travel is orchestrated from beginning to end for God's plan. Christmas travel started in Nazareth, moving through a young couple, moving through verification through an old couple, to let them know that God is doing miracles because his son is showing up on planet Earth. But that's not all, because the, the, the travel log doesn't end there. We find out later on, when the baby child grows up to be 33, he travels. But this time he travels to a place called Golgotha, called the skull, the place where he's to die for our sin. See, he had to be born because Sin came into the world by one man, Adam and Eve, but sin needed to be taken out of the world by another Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, sin had to leave, so we're still traveling. But now we travel through the garden where Jesus has been betrayed, where Jesus has been kissed, where Jesus has been spat on, where Jesus has been hit. Then we travel a little further, and he goes through false nighttime court appointments where these people are accusing him of stuff he didn't do. They didn't ki- accuse him of being king of kings and lord of lords. They accused him of just being here, and they didn't like him because sin was in the world, and they were trying to destroy him. Travel a little further, and Mary and Joseph is no longer in the picture, but we see, except for Mary, Mary is there. And he travels now to the cross, and they nail him on a cross to die for your sins and for mine. And then they kill him. And he dies, and they take him off the cross, and they travel him to a place, and they put him in a grave, a stone that was carved out. But he travels in there for just for over a day and a night. They put him there on Friday, but he travels out when we're not looking. Because they go back in there, and they look, and he ain't there. Because he done got out of there. He came just to be here for a while. And we come to find out the angels were there waiting at the tomb, and when the people showed up, they said, what y'all doing here? He came here to die for you, and he rose again for you. And he rises now, and he has all power in heaven and earth in his hands. This travelogue doesn't end because he is now traveled, and he sent his Holy Spirit to be with us because he didn't step on a cloud and ascended back into glory. And he said, but don't be afraid, don't be ashamed, don't be scared. There's that angel again. For unto you, I'll send you an angel. And, and he'll be in you, and he'll be with my, my Holy Spirit will be in you and with you. And he'll, he'll, he'll move inside of you. So he travels again, but now he's traveling. Not around us, but in us. Everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ now has the Holy Spirit in them. And now he gives us the hope and the help. Not because he's near, because he's right here with us every day. Amen? Christmas travels was for our glory, for our benefit, and for our use. Listen, y'all, listen, y'all. The consequences of traveling for Christmas this year, or, or back then, was to bless us. The consequences for traveling this year, or here's, here's one of the reasons, is so that you will travel wherever you go, across the street, across the city, across the world, 
make sure that when you travel this Christmas, don't just travel and walk into the house and say, Merry Christmas. Tell somebody your testimony about how God has blessed you. <laughs> Secondly, do some tangible work for God during Christmas. Don't just buy stuff that you like. Don't just go on Google and find stuff you like and order it for you and, and supply yourself. And every time a package comes in, it's for you. Make sure you give some tangible help to somebody who really needs it. You know somebody who needs a meal. You know somebody who needs some hope. You know somebody who needs a hospital visit. You know somebody who needs a text message to let them know everything's going to be all right. Do something tangible and reach out to somebody who's struggling in a hospital, somebody who's struggling in a jail, somebody who's struggling being lonely by themselves, somebody str struggling as an elderly person by themselves, somebody struggling as a single person in a dorm room in college or in the military who just needs a word of encouragement. And thirdly, pray for somebody. And when I say pray for somebody, I don't mean you give somebody that empty little promise, okay, baby, I'll pray for you. No! Stop what you're doing and pray right now. I do that all the time, and I learned to do it a long time ago. When I tell somebody I pray for you, I say, matter of fact, let's pray right now. And I stop right there in the middle of the aisle. I say, Lord, what's your prayer request? Well, I got to go have a procedure done at the hospital. Lord, for the procedure that needs to be done, bless so-and-so. Or we're going through such and such with our marriage. Or we're going through such and such with, with this in my life and that in my life. Learn to pray for your friends and family on the spot. Have a prayer ready to go. Listen, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to know everything from Genesis to Revelation and all the parts in between. You just need to have a heart for God. And you need to have a memory when you were in need and somebody prayed for you and cared for you and called you and checked on you and worked for you and encouraged your heart and brought you a meal. Amen? This is Christmas travel. Christmas ought to travel with you. Ah! Just as you travel for Christmas, let Christmas travel with you. Amen? It's about the Christmas child. Somebody give God praise. I'm done.